Good morning, everybody. It's Dr. Madeleine Muller here, and we're sitting live at the CMH Family Medicine Boardroom for the monthly broadcast um, of our HIV and case discussions in adults um, here from CMH. We are very happy to be welcoming Dr. Govender, who together with input from Dr. Fuentes has been preparing a presentation for us on the ocular manifestations of HIV infection. And we were actually chatting about the fact that fortunately with the ARV um, program rollout and the early initiation, we don't see as much of this as we did uh, maybe even a decade ago. But it's still important for us to be able to know what to do for those patients that do present with advanced HIV disease um, and be able to show that we pick up the things early and refer appropriately. So thank you very much for Dr. Govender for doing this presentation. Just a reminder to um, please put your um, details in the chat for attendance register um, purposes. And um, thank you very much, Dr. Govender. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Benelin Govender, and I'm one of the interns currently doing my family medicine rotation at CMH. And today I've been given the privilege to speak on ocular manifestations of HIV. So to begin before speaking on the topic, I'd like to start off with the case presentation. Um, so we have Mrs. NB, a 55 year old female unemployed referred from the local clinic with a two year history of a upper of a left upper eyelid growth, which isn't painful, but obscure in vision. So after sitting down with the patient and taking a history, we found that she was diagnosed with HIV in 2008, and she was started on treatment with AZT, 3TC, and efavirenz. Um, she was then diagnosed with biological failure um, and started Regimen 2 in 2013, which was Tenofovir, FTC, and Aluvia. Um, she has a history of multiple episodes of default in a treatment, and she has been off treatment since 2020. We, she was previously treated for pulmonary TB in 2012, and there's a history of traumatic eye injury, which she was stabbed on the right eye 25 years ago, leaving that eye blind. Um, she has no history of illicit drug use, no alcohol use or smoking, and she has no known allergies. She has not been sexually active for the past five years. Yeah. However, it was noted that she had ne never had a pap smear done and she wasn't exposed to TPT yet. Um, so if you look at the points that we've covered, we're trying to um, narrow our, our, di our differential diagnosis by trying to look for possible infections, allergies, and um, other opportunistic infections. So the patient was referred to ophthalmology. And when she was seen by the ophthalmologist, um, they've done a CT for her, uh, which showed a left upper eyelid that was um, a lobulated mass measuring 47 by 40 millimeters, slightly compressing the anterior surface of the eyeball. Um, so they managed her with excision of the tumor and part of the lacrimal gland, and it was sent for histology, which came back positive for Merkel cell carcinoma. She was, um, all, it was also found that she had distant metastasis, and then she was further referred to oncology. So the importance of this was the early recognition of an ocular manifestation and promptly acting um, and further investigating it because Merkel cell carcinoma is a very rare um, cancer which rapidly spreads throughout the body. So for today's um, topic on ocular manifestations, we're just going to have a quick uh, overview of the topic, some background information. I'll discuss the anatomy of the eye as well as a fundoscopic exam, uh, some ocular manifestations, and the main bulk of our talk today on the classification of the ocular manifestations. So ocular, ocular manifestations in the HIV uh, population has historically been a very common finding before the introduction of ARVs. Approximately 70 to 80% of HIV infected people were treated for an HIV associated eye condition during their illness. This has uh, been rapidly decreasing due to the advancements in our HIV treatment. 
Uh, CD4 count is generally used to predict the onset of a general condition and ocular manifestations or infections. So on this slide, you can see that there's um, a graph that represents the CD4 count in relation to the infection of year, uh, the infection, the years of infection. Um, and these generally, this graph shows in a patient that would have not been on any ARV treatment. So as you can see, like with the CD4 count of less than 500, we start getting our cancers and opportunistic infections that have been introduced. And it was of great note that a CD4 count of less than 100 showed the most ocular manifestations. So CD4 levels correlate with the progress progression of the disease and a decreased viral load um, correlates with better prognosis. So as we all know that the HIV virus is a single-stranded RNA virus that targets the CD4 lymphocytes and is spread through bodily fluids. Um, that is your blood, uh, 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 vaginal secretions, as well as breast milk. And according to the CDC, at the end of 2022, um, 40.4 million lives have been claimed by HIV, and there's still ongoing transmission. An estimated 39 million people living with HIV, and of that, two-thirds are in the African region. So there are many complications of HIV that being direct and indirect, direct meaning uh, directly contributed by HIV virus itself and indirectly by opportunistic infections, neoplasms and possible drug relations. Um, so just a fact before I move on to give you the segmental um, anatomy of the eye, that the eye represents only 0.1% of the total body surface area and only 0.27% of the anterior body surface area. Yet the significance to individuals and society is disproportionately higher. <clears throat> so the anatomy of the eye. Um, the eye is located... Um, in an orbital cavity, which is protect, uh, the eye protected by the bony cavity, as well as adipose tissue. The eye itself is made of three layers, um, the fibrous layer, um, the inner layer, which is also known as a vascular, vascular layer, and a neurological layer. The fi fibrous layer contains the sclera and the cornea, and then when we move on to the vascular layer, we start from anterior. Um, it would really involve the iris, ciliary body, and the choroid. And then you move on to a deeper structure, which is the um, retina itself. The eye is then divided into segments, it, into the anterior and posterior segment. The anterior segment being from the cornea to the lens, and the posterior segment beginning from the lens to the retina. The anterior segment is further divided into anterior and posterior chambers where aqueous um, fluid circulates in the eye. That is also an important um, concept when we talk about um, inflammation of the ciliary bodies, which could lead to glaucoma, which is an eye emergency. So this um, is another picture of the anatomy of the eye with the more detailed labeling. I just like to mention um, some of the pathological uh, conditions that occur uh, with regards to anatomy. Um, so if you look at the cornea, so when we have infection, generally infection will follow inflammation. And when certain parts of the eye become inflamed, they term differently. Mm -hmm. So when we have inflammation of the cornea, it's regarded as keratitis. Inflammation of the sclera is scleritis. And then inflammation going on to your uvea or the inner layer, which is your vascular layer, starting off with the ciliary body and the iris is known as iridocyclitis. And inflammation of the iris itself is also known as iritis, or another term is called anterior uveitis. Then we also have inflammation of the choroid, which is called choroiditis, or traditional term also called posterior uveitis. Then we also have the inflammation of the retina itself, which is called retinitis. Um, because of the intimate relationships between these three layers, they could um, be combined. So if you have beginning inflammation of the retina that spreads to your 
choroid we term it retinal choroiditis but if you had inflammation that began in the choroid going posteriorly to the retina we will start we would call that um, uh, chorioretinitis so this is the normal fundoscopic exam of the eye and we can appreciate the optic disc as well as the optic uh, cup you do see the um, retinal vessels which are the veins and the arteries and one way to distinguish between the veins and the arteries are that the arteries are narrower in comparison to the veins moving on to the right of the optic disc you'll see there's a darker uh, circular um, indentation within uh, the visual field which is called the macula and the most central darker um, area is called the fovea and that is where you get your most accurate vision so it's always important to remember what a normal fundoscopic exam will look like when we differentiate between different pathologies. So ocular manifestations can be divided into infectious cause and non-infectious cause. So your infectious cause is directly due to the HIV virus itself. And then once decreasing levels of CD4 um, with patients that are untreated, you get much more opportunistic infections. And then the non-infectious causes um, are neoplasms, autoimmune uh, disorders, and drug-related reactions. So the bulk of our, our conversation today would be on the classification of um, the eye. So as I uh, told you that the eye is divided into anterior posterior segments, as well as the external layers of the eye. So we're going to start off by speaking on the adenexal manifestations. So, and the common uh, ocular adenexal lesions are, as listed below, so we'll go through in detail of the first five. So, herpes zoster ophthalmicus occurs in about 5 to 15% of HIV patients, um, and this uh, occurs generally when you have an infection first of varicella zoster virus, and um, the virus then becomes dormant within your um, dorsal root ganglion. And then a reactivation of the latent infection um, in the dorsal root ganglion of the trigeminal nerve, more specifically the ophthalmic branch, uh, causes um, this lesion to have an outbreak. So it, um, patients generally will complain of a painful unilateral maculopapular vesicular rash, um, and it generally in the distribution of the ophthalmic um, nerve. It um, also involves the upper eyelid, but does not cross the midline. Many complications may occur with herpes zoster ophthalmicus, um, such as your keratitis, which is involved in the cornea, scleritis, uveitis, retinitis, retinal necrosis, or CNS involvement. We've also, we've also seen some cases where they describe cranial nerve palsies, such as your Horner's syndrome. Uh, Hutchinson's sign is one of the important um, signs to look out for. So that's basically when there's a lesion at the tip of the nose or the margin of your nose. That generally indicates that there's nasociliary involvement and following that would definitely be ocular involvement. Um, these are some pictures to illustrate um, the distribution and the uh, maculopapular vesicular rash of herpes zoster ophthalmicus. And a picture on the upper right is showing a superimposed bacterial infection, and it's noted by the discharge that's uh, seen on the patient's eye. The, uh, the picture on the lower left, uh, lower right corner shows um, hyperpigmentation post herpes zoster ophthalmicus infection. So the management of herpes zoster ophthalmicus, um, this regimen, um, which we would start generally when the patient would come complaining of symptoms, is most uh, effective when started within 72 hours of the vesicular lesions. And we generally use our antiviral treatments. We'd like to start with giving intravenous acyclovir first for seven days, followed by oral acyclovir for uh, an additional seven days. So when we do treat um, herpes zoster ophthalmicus, the treatment then reduces the frequency of recurrence. Antibiotics generally are used if the superimposed bacterial infection. You'd like to send a swab to get more specific um, uh, organisms so you can tailor your antibiotics to the organism. 
ensure that you um, supply the patient with adequate analgesia because these lesions have known to be quite painful. Topical steroids, um, either as drops or as creams, may be used as well as systemic glucocorticoids to reduce inflammation of the eye and prevent further corneal damage. So moving on to Kaposi sarcoma, uh, it occurs in 25% of patients. Um, again, this was before the introduction of uh, antiretroviral therapy. It's um, caused by the human herpes virus type 8. Um, and it involves a mesenchymal-derived vascular neoplasm of the sclera and conjunctiva. And patients really uh, usually present with pain, photophobia, recurrent red eye, mucopurulent discharge, um, blurred vision, or visual obstruction. And these nodules are noted to be purplish to red in color. And once there's eyelid and conjunctival Kaposi sarcoma, it tends to mimic something called a Calaisian and localize some conjunctival hemorrhages, both conditions uh, of which are not as serious as Kaposi sarcoma. Um, it is a very progressive disease, so it affects other body systems such as the GI tract and CNS. Um, complications of it could be trichiasis and uh, entropion formation. So when we, we use the word trichiasis, it just basically means that the eyelashes grow in different directions. And if they grow in the direction facing in, inward towards the eye, they cause further damage to the eye. And entro entropion and just it relates to the eyelids itself and malpositioning of the eyelids. Um, these are some other examples of Kaposi sarcoma of the eye. And you can see it's it's a quite an elevated um, lesion that will occur on the eye. So your management of Kaposi sarcoma is generally radiotherapy. Chemotherapy may be used both systemically and intralesionally. Um, to treat Kaposi sarcoma, and surgical excision of the tumor can also be done. Moving on to molluscum contagiosum, um, it occurs in about 20% of HIV-infected patients. It is a highly contagious dermatitis caused by the DNA pox virus, and it may affect mucous membranes as well as the skin. Um, it's seen as many, uh, seen as painless, single or multiple, small, firm, um, painless umbilicated lesions, which produce a waxy discharge when pressured. Um, in uh, patients that are not immunocompromised, it's generally a, a self-limiting disease and spontaneously resolves, um, taking months to years. Also, patients that are immunocompromised with suppressed viral loads and higher CD4 counts, they tend to resolve by themselves. So we can appreciate in these pictures that along the eyelid, you would see these uh, small uh, firm lesions and they could either be singular or multiple. So if we had to treat them, there's um, local treatment. Um, so we use um, three types of local treatment. There's topical retinoids, topical Im immunomodulators, and potassium hydroxide um, can be used to locally treat um, these infections. Um, cryotherapy with liquid, liquid nitrogen has also been used, and salicylic acid in combination with sodium nitrates or povidine iodine solution has also been shown to uh, markedly reduce the occurrence as well as the size of the lesions. And in immunocompromised patients with refractory disease, um, the, they have been treated with sidofa. Um, so the next one is your conjunctival microvasculopathy, which um, is quite common and it occurs in 70 to 80% of your HIV infected patients. And this is generally due to the increased plasma viscosity, as well as immune complex depositions that are believed to deposit within uh, the conjunctiva. Um, direct infection of the conjunctival vascular endothelium by HIV itself also causes it, and it's painless and does not really cause any irritation to the patient. Uh, these changes include segmental vascular dilation and narrowing, microaneurysm formation, and appear as a comma-shaped vascular fragment. 
So generally, these lesions are not painful. They tend to resolve when the patient is being virologically suppressed, or sometimes if the patient is having um, a very high viral loads, they tend to stay a bit longer. Uh, conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma is the third most common neoplasm associated with HIV infections. Um, it occurs with redness of the eye and variable degrees of irritation. Um, it manifests as pink gelatinous growths and often an engorged blood vessel that's feeding the tumor may be seen. A uh, deep invasion and metastasis is generally rare in this condition, uh, condition and it's limited only to the eye. So treatment is local excision and cryotherapy. Okay, so moving on to the anterior segment of the anterior segment manifestations. And we can see that more than 50, it occurs in more than 50% of HIV um, patients. And common conditions, uh, symptoms include irritation, pain, photophobia, redness, and decreased vision. So most of your anterior manifestations would give you these symptoms. Um, but today we're going to be speaking about keratoconjunctivitis sica, infectious keratitis, and iridocyclitis. And as you can see from the picture, the anterior segment is from the cornea just past the lens. So keratoconjunctivitis sica, also known as dry eye, occurs in about 10 to 20% of patients and is related to HIV uh, mediated inflammation and damage to the accessory and major lacrimal glands. Um, so patients generally will present with burning, uncomfortable red eyes. It initially would be watery and followed by complete dryness of the eye. So these patients are generally managed with artificial tears and lubricating ointments. So moving on to infectious keratitis, the main etiologies are viral, which is your VZV and HSV. They're more frequent and less severe. And then you have your bacterial and fungal, which are less frequent, but more severe. The most common fungal organism is candida, especially in intravenous drug uses. So viral keratitis man manifests um, as follows, and we can differentiate between varicella zoster virus and herpes simplex virus by the dermatomal distribution. So in varicella zoster virus, you have more of a complete distribution along the dermatome, whereas with HIV, it's more incomplete. Uh, there's more pain in varicella compared to um, herpes simplex virus, and the scarring is more frequently seen in varicella zoster when compared to herpes simplex virus. Post-hepatic uh, neuralgia occurs more frequently with varicella infections as opposed to herpes uh, simplex virus. And then the pattern of uh, damage to the eye uh, with varicella is usually small without a central ulceration or terminal bulbs. When compared to a herpes where you have la larger damage to the cornea with central ulceration and terminal bulbs. Iris atrophy um, is sectoral in varicella and is more patchy in your herpes simplex virus. And the recurrence of lytic epithelial keratitis, um, there's no recurrence in varicella, but there's many more frequent recurrence in herpes zoster virus. So as you can see from these pictures, the herpes zoster um, virus um, does have smaller ulcerations when compared to your uh, herpes zoster on the lower left corner. So if you look at your lower left picture, you can see it's been stained with um, fluorescent staining and used a UV light to visualize the dendritic pattern of the ulceration seen on the cornea. And with your uh, herpes zoster virus, there's much more corneal damage as seen with, on the picture on your right lower part of the screen. Uh, management of varicella zoster is generally with oral acyclova or famcyclova, and chronic treatment may, re may be required for varicella zoster keratitis, and this will usually minimize symptoms and shorten the duration of the viral shedding. 
Severe disciform stromal keratitis is treated with topical corticosteroids. And the reason is to reduce the inflammation so that we can reduce damage to further damage to the cornea. Uh, herpes simplex virus keratitis is managed with debridement. So we debride them with a dry cotton tip applicator or a cellulose sponge. So this could decrease the um, load of the infectious virus and viral agents. And we can use topical acyclovir as well as giving oral acyclovir or famcyclovir. Irodocyclitis, again, this is an inflammation of the iris and the ciliary body of the eye. It's a sequelae of retinitis, retinochoroiditis, and drug toxicity, mainly being your rifabutin and sidofa. Symptoms include redness, pain, and photophobia. And it clinically, the clinical signs um, um, are seen cells in the anterior chamber. The chamber, keratin um, precipitates and hypopion. So hypopion just means that there's pus in the anterior chamber and as seen in this picture. And it will you'll see like there's a level where if the patient moves, the internal fluid moves along with as well. Um, mild iridocyclitis is associated with viral retinitis and it's due to your cytomegalovirus, your herpes simplex virus and your varicella zoster virus. And uh, more severe iridocyclitis is, has been associated with ocular toxoplasmosis, tuberculosis infection, syphilis, bacterial, and fungal retinitis. So the picture A shows iridocyclitis and B is iritis. So we, we like to differentiate between these two. Sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate because um, the ciliary bodies are, are not visualized when looking uh, directly at the eye or on pandoscopy. But there are some findings that would make you, would lean you more towards iridocyclitis. And that's the more broad, broader inflammation ranging on the entire iris until the pupil. And then seen on iritis, you still would see some of the markings of the iris that is not inflamed. So management of iridocyclitis um, is topical corticosteroid drops are frequently used, but with extreme caution and with proper antimicrobial coverage when infection is suspected. So generally, we'd like to treat the infection first. Once we've been treating and managing the infection, the inflammation would reduce spontaneously with treatment of the infection. But it, if inflammation is still um, ongoing, that's the time that we'd like to use our topical corticosteroids. And if uh, toxicity from medications is suspected, the dose should be tapered or the causative agent should be discontinued. Moving on to the posterior segment manifestations. This occurs in about 50% of HIV patients. Um, symptoms are floaters um, of the eye, flashing lights, visual field defects, and decreased visual acuity. Uh, it usually, you usually see the presence of an afferent pupillary defect, strongly su suggestive of retinal or optic nerve involvement. Um, diagnoses are based on clinical evidence and it is seen on phonoscopic exam. So the two main uh, posterior segment manifestations that we will speak about is your HIV retinopathy and your HIV-related retinochoroiditis. HIV retinopathy, is, it occurs in about 50 to 70% of HIV-infected patients, and this is caused through arteriolar occlusions in HIV retinal microvasculopathy that leads to interruption of the axoplasmic flow and subsequent accumulation of axoplasmic debris within the eye. Um, in, increased plasma viscosity, immune complex depositions, and a direct um, cytopathic effect of the virus on the retinal vascular endothelium are believed to also be involved. So your HIV retinopathy um, generally manifests um, 
with patients not complaining of any symptoms at all and is transient, uh, but it may contribute to optic nerve atrophy, uh, which have been seen in many patients. Um, you, also, just a point to note that um, the um, HIV retinopathy is, is much very much similar to your diabetic and hypertensive um, retinopathies because it's of it's dealing with the vasculature of the eye. So common findings that you would find on fundoscopy would be cotton wool spots, um, intraretinal hemorrhages, rot spots with central hemorrhages, and retinal microaneurysms. These patients generally do not require um, treatment. Um, then the only treatment is managing the chronic illness. So for um, HIV, you would want to manage the HIV and hope that this would spontaneously resolve. <laughs> So HIV-related retinochorioditis um, can be caused by viruses, bacteria, parasites, and fungus. And I would I chose six of them to talk about today. So we're going to talk about cytomegaloretinitis. So cytomegaloretinitis is the most common cause of intraocular infection. Um, this usually occurs when the CD4 count is less than 50 and patients present with a painless progressive loss of vision. Um, clinically, they present with a wide range of appearances from cotton wool spots to confluent areas of full thickness retinal necrosis. Uh, infection spread centrifugally uh, from the focus with uh, advancement of lesions to the border towards the fovea, like a bushfire pattern, which is appreciated um, on these pictures on the slide. Management of a CMV retinitis. Um, so the drug of choice is your Valgan cyclover. Um, and the treatment guideline is there as follows. There's also use of Gan cyclover, uh, but we use Gan cyclover with a bit of more precaution due to its adverse effects of myelosuppression. And foscarnet could also be an alternate, but please ensure that you hydrate your patients with at least a liter of normal saline before giving foscarnet because uh, of its, it is known to cause uh, renal toxicity. So Dofovirg, again, can also be used. So we use mainly our antiv uh, antiviral therapies, either at the beginning IV and then moving on to oral treatment. Moving on to acute retinal necrosis. Um, it is a fluminant retinal vascular, vascular occlusive necrotizing retinitis, and it's usually due to varicella zoster virus, but may also be caused by your HSV and CMV as well. Um, patients generally present with acute onset of visual loss in one eye associated with redness, photophobia, pain, floaters, and flashes. And then on fundoscopic exam, we see small necrotic yellow lesions in the periphery, which rapidly spread into large confluent white areas, most often involving the entire peripheral retina. Optic neuritis and retinal, retinal detachment are frequent complications of acute retinal necrosis. So on this picture, you can see the yellowish necrosis uh, more uh, involving the peripherals of your retina. So acute tubular uh, retinal necrosis is frequently complicated by anterior uveitis, ret retinal and choroidal vasculitis, your vitriasis, episcleritis, scleritis, or optic neuritis. So when I was discussing the anatomy of the eye, there's a very intimate relationship between all the layers of the eye. So once the retina is damaged, it starts to progressively damage structures going from posterior to anterior. So it's treated with high doses of intravenous acyclover or famcyclover, and it's combined with laser treatment to prevent retinal detachment. Because once there's retinal detachment, that will lead to blindness. So your progressive retinal necrosis, rapidly progressive retinal necrosis is caused by a varicella zoster, um, also known as varicella zoster retinitis, is a rapidly progressive necrotizing um, retinitis 
which is caused by VZV without vitritis or retinal vasculitis. Um, on fun fundoscopy, you usually see a white lesion with no hemorrhages or exudates. They can be multifocal, they're deep to the retina, they're opaque and, and patchy at times. The lesions start from the posterior pole of the fundus and spreads um, with extreme rapidity to involve the entire retina. Um, so treatment is usually unsatisfactory and usually requires a comp combination of cancyclovir and acyclovir. And these patients generally have a poor, a very poor pro prognosis because they more likely would get retinal uh, detachment. Moving on to ocular tuberculosis. Um, so the most common causes of ocular tuberculosis are your anterior uveitis, also known as iritis, and disseminated choroiditis. So when we um, screen the patient, we'd like to look for constitutional symptoms because uh, ocular manifestations generally occur in advanced um, TB infections. So we, we, they're generally before the ocular manifestations, they're present with malaise, night sweats, and pulmonary complaints such as cough and dyspnea. And if they did not present in the early time of the TB infection, and they present to us now with this ocular manifestation, we do see areas of necrosis surrounding, surrounded by mononuclear and giant cells. It could be unifocal or multifocal, yellowish gray or white, choroiditis, mostly in the posterior pole, as seen in these pictures. So your management of ocular TB, it's the same management as you would manage someone with pulmonary TB. So you'd initiate them with two months on initiation phase of REFA4, and then four months of continuation phase with rifampicin and isoniazide. Corticosteroids, topical and or orally, may be used to control your inflammation to prevent further progression of ocular manifestations. Um, and you can taper them down over six to 12 weeks. Your pyridoxine is given to prevent peripheral neuritis. So when, when we start patients on TB treatment, um, we were supposed to do an eye examination, especially because one of the drugs that causes visual impairment is Tambutol. So according to recommendations, as early as 2014 from WHO, they recommended that um, uh, um, visual acuity test should be done before the initiation of your TB treatment. And from the most recent guidelines in, in the British HIV Association, which was in 2019, visual acuity and color vision tests should be done before starting patients on TB treatment, as well as doing routine monthly check, uh, eye examinations, making sure that visual acuity and color vision is still intact. Uh, so toxoplasma retino chondritis, um, it causes blurred vision or reduced vision. Uh, you see floaters, photophobia, redness, and pain. Um, this is a very interesting one because on fundoscopy, uh, a focal necrotizing retinitis may be visualized with white infiltrations and surrounding retinal edema. If, if you do just have a look at those pictures, it looks more like the retina is burnt and it often has a bilateral and multifocal mm -hmm. disease associated with anterior uveitis, vitritis, with no uh, pigmented scars adjacent to the areas of retinal, retinal necrosis. So your management of toxoplasma would be for active retinal choroiditis within two to three millimeters uh, of the disc of fovea, which may threaten your vision, or peripheral lesions associated with severe vitritis, you like to start uh, first-line therapy for three to six weeks as follows. So you'll give your pyrimethamine, uh, folic acid, and sulfadiazine. Um, lastly, we have syphilis. So syphilis can occur in uh, any ocular structure. Um, starting anteriorly from your conjunctiva, causing conjunctivitis, keratitis, uveitis, and chorioretinitis. 
and it's associated with neurosyphilis, also known as tertiary syphilis, in up to 85% of cases. So the diagnosis uh, is confirmed by doing TPHA, and we usually do VDRL or RPR to monitor the response to treatment. So the treat, you treat as tertiary syphilis, which will give your IV penicillin G, um, 24 million units per day in four to six divided doses for 10 days. Okay, now moving on to neuroophthalmic manifestations. Um, neuroophthalmic manifestations occur in about 10 to 15% of patients who are infected with HIV. Common causes include your meningitis of any cause, like be TB meningitis or cryptococcal meningitis, meningeal and parenchymal lymphoma, your neurosyphilis and toxoplasmosis. And the common findings that you would see is your papilledema due to your increased intracranial pressure, optic neuritis, cranial nerve palsies, and ocular motility disorders and visual field defects. So this is a picture to uh, show you papilledema. So the normal optic disc on your right, you can see that it has nice sharp disc margins as co compared to the picture on your left where it shows blurred disc margins. Um, so management of neuroophthalmic um, manifestations is generally radiation and chemotherapy if it is a lymphoma, more specific antibiotics for the infectious causes, and systemic steroids, again, are indicated in severe uh, cases of optic neuritis. You'd like to give a high-dose short course of uh, glucocorticosteroids. Um, now moving on to orbital manifestations. So orbital manifestations, uh, the most common complications include your orbital lymphomas, your orbital cellulitis due to aspergillus infection, or your orbital Kaposi sarcoma. So as you can see from these three pictures, um, it's, it's uh, evident to differentiate that your orbital lymphoma occurs on the inner surface of the eye, which involve, could involve your skin sclera as well as your conjunctiva and it generally you can see an elevated tumor within the eye with your orbital cellulitis it the patients have a periorbital edema and swelling and the eyes are generally shut closed with orbital kaposi sarcoma it's also a systemic disease so you'd want to treat your uh, orbital kaposi sarcoma with chemotherapy and lastly, we're going to speak about drug-related uh, ocular toxicity. So our first three drugs are our TB medication. So atambutol causes central or peripheral retrobulbar neuritis. Your isoniazide causes your optic neuritis. Uh, Rifabutin is intraocular inflammation and uveitis, which were seen in 33% of patients that were subsequently treated for HIV and TB. Your sedofova causes uveitis and intraocular hypotony, which was seen in 25 to 30% of HIV infected patients. Can, can cyclover and acyclover causes corneal epithelial inclusion, termed corneal. Um, li lipidosis. Um, from the research, they showed that it's not as common as the other drug manifestations. And atro atrovaquin causes corneal subepithelial deposits. So the adverse effects are dose-related in most of these drugs, and they resolve following discontinuation of the drug with the exception of um, abnormal retinal pigmentation changes. So my take home message is that ocular manifestations in HIV infected uh, individuals are quite common and mostly diag diagnosis is needed to be made with fundoscopy and a slit lamp examination and management occurs at specialist levels. Uh, it 
It is, however, important to recognize symptoms and signs early and refer for further management to prevent progress, progression of the disease. Low CD4 counts um, should cause an index of suspicion and require screening for opportunistic infections such as your CMV, varicella zoster virus, cryptococcus TB, as well as your treponema pallidum. And an important note to remember that all patients with these eye conditions should continue on the highly active antiviral therapies unless it is contraindicated. Uh, these are my references. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Govender. Um, I think of all my years in HIV medicine, that's probably one of the most comprehensive talks we've had on ophthalmic manifestations. So thank you very much. That's also going to make it um, a great resource uh, for the future. Um, I'm just going to add in a couple of little comments. So the one thing that I found interesting there is the the epidemiology in terms of the frequency with which some of the conditions like 10%, 30%, and those are all people who are not on art, which is why I think it is so much less common because we're getting our patients onto ARVs. So a lot of our data is people who are not, not on, on ARVs, and most of those um, complications obviously go away almost completely if they're, if they're taking um, ARVs. Um, so I think one of the top tips, especially for the nurses out there, so quite often if we see somebody with one of those horrible tumors on the eye or quite clearly a, a very, somebody who's suddenly gone blind, we know to refer. But what we don't want to miss is that Hutchison sign. So a patient who comes in, comes in, um, slightly weird, tingly forehead, um, and the only thing that they have is actually a funny little rash on the tip of the nose and there's not much else to, else to, else to. Um, shingles do not necessarily present with all the classic vesicular rash and maybe all you pick up early is a funny little spot on the nose now that funny little spot on the nose might mean that there is actually the um, ocular nerve has been affected and it might very well mean that they actually have a keratitis and what you're supposed to be doing is putting some fluorescein in that eye, an easy and cheap investigation that we should hopefully have access to, and then use your fluorescent light to, to find that keratitis. So we want to pick those up early and treat them, or you can end up with corneal scarring of those patients. So that's just one of those, those tips for our patients, patients, patients um, uh, yeah, with, with the CD4 counts, but actually shingles can be seen in, in any of our patients. Um, and then just a comment on the ethambutol. So obviously in South Africa, we've got a massive um, TB program, and this has come up repeatedly in terms of the risk of ethambutol and optic neuropathies. Um, and I think what we've seen in South Africa, which is why we are slightly less paranoid than the rest of the world, is that the two months ethambutol at the dosing that we give in our current TB regimens, uh, hardly ever. As a matter of fact, I have not yet seen an optic neuropathy caused by ethambutol in those first, in just the two months. The challenge comes in our drug-resistant TB program. So if you've got patients that are taking ethambutol for longer than two months and in the higher dosages, like we are using it in the, in the MDR um, TB program, there definitely is a risk. And especially if you're combining it with linezolid, which can also cause a potential optic neuropathies. So at the moment, we're not doing visual acuities routinely in our TB patients. That's not part of our guidelines, but it is part of the guidelines for our drug-resistant TB patients. And that definitely gets missed. So we do sometimes see that people are not doing that visual acuity on the start of treatment, and we're supposed to be doing a visual acuity um, every single month. Um, and it's an easy, easy enough test to do that we should be able to do. Uh, just in terms of complications, and I'm glad Doc mentioned that as well, we've recently had a patient here at CMH in Ward 5 that is, is actually completely blind due to a cryptococcal meningitis, which was partly diagnosed late uh, somewhere else, not here. Um, and when the cryptococcal meningitis was diagnosed, he was put on the amphotericin B um, and the fluconazole, but he had high intracranial pressures and he was not tapped daily. So he had a high, he must have had a high intracranial pressure over a, a, a long period of time, which actually then completely um, destroyed the, the back of those, those optic nerves, which we could then see on our fundoscopy here. Um, and he's been left with permanent blindness because of that. So quite often when we think of ocular manifestations of HIV, we just think of CMV. Um, but actually we need to be very careful also with our patients with meningitis that we protect, protect that vision. Um, so thank you very much.
I'd like to open, um, so those in on the call, can you please remember to put your names in the chat if you haven't yet done so um, with your, your um, registration numbers. And I'm just looking at these questions. Oh, there's a question here about seeing conditions in children with HIV. So most of our really bad um, HIV complication, ocular manifestations is very much linked to CD4 count. So Doc showed that um, picture in the beginning there Oh, all that slide in the beginning there where he was talking about the CD4 count. And it's in the very low CD4 counts that we can. So yes, in the old days, we would see things like CMV retinitis in, for example, children with very low CD4 counts, age children. In our current regimen, because we've got so few children these days with HIV and the vast majority of them will be on ARVs and should be well suppressed on ARVs, it's actually very, very, very uncommon in children. Um, I'm just seeing if there's any other questions. Yeah, so those of you that's using more than one device, yeah, please send the names, um, name, surname, and the number of everybody that is that is attending. That's very helpful. Well done. Um, and maybe also those of you that was from PE that's sitting at one device, please send me an email address for those three people so that we can then um, able to send them, um, get in contact with them if need be in terms of the CPD. Um, any questions, comments from uh, the floor here at CMH? Um, Dr. Fuentes? Thank you very much for the presentation. Look like you have a, a good a, a treatment supported there. <laughs> so I just want to emphasize on something that Dr. Muller said at the beginning of the presentation, and is that since the implementation of the UTT, all of this ocular complication has been decreased dramatically. But we are still having our community, a lot of people that they don't know their status, that they refuse to be testing, that they are failing regimens and they default in treatments. Okay. So most of this ocular manifestation has been treated or, or they are treated by the ophthalmology, but we need to do our part. So as I always say, we need to make a habit that every time that the patient is coming to you, irrespective of the reason of the consultation, offer the HIV counseling test. If they are found to be positive, okay, linked to care, but if the patient is negative, individualize this person and according with the risk of exposure, advise to the patient when the patient needs to come back again for retesting. And the other thing, we need to try to find a good and practical system in place to know how we can trace the defaulters to prevent that the patient come I mean, with complications like this one, okay? And my last comment will be that some of these conditions are permanent, okay? So the patient can be disabled. And this one is causing to the patient loss of self-esteem. The patient can lose the job. So we need to do the screening for depression in our patients too. Thank you very much, Dr. Fee. And just actually just to add to that, because that's something I have picked up, is that we actually pick up a lot of patients just in our general population with very poor vision. And I'm always surprised here. We do very regular visual screening here at Ward 5, and we pick up patients who are extraordinarily blind. Uh, you're actually surprised that they, and they've not actually even been picked up before. And you might be the first person who noticed they've got a severe visual acuity, uh, maybe even just something like a cataract or due to a complication from um, something in HIV in the past. Um, and we are not very good at referring those patients to occupational therapy for assisted devices, for example, to help them to look at how to rearrange um, home their homes to be able to function better. So just to remember our rehabilitation teams and using our MDTs and not assuming somebody has sorted it out. If you've got somebody coming in with a family is leading them in and sort of helping them negotiate their way around the waiting room and they do not have a white stick, then probably they have not yet been referred to, to the rehab guys to actually help them cope better with their disability. So thanks for bringing that up as well. Um, thank you, Dr. Adenay. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Govinda. I think, uh, like Dr. Muller said, that was quite a very comprehensive uh, uh, look at ocular manifestations in HIV. The epidemiology were pre pre uh, UTT uh, uh, data, and perhaps that's the only thing I will change in your presentation. Um, the and again the your, the systematic approach in terms of looking at the high from the you know 
from the anterior portion down to the posterior part of the eye was quite remarkable as well, looking at the various uh, uh, conditions that we should be worried about. And I think that's quite commendable. The very first comment will focus on the uh, apis, you know, uh, varicella sustal optamicus. You, we still see that quite, you know, if despite, uh, you know, increasing access to ART, because again, it can actually be part of a masking iris in some patients. Mm -hmm. But critically, the, um, the aspect that we don't do as much as we should do for patients is pain care. The, it's if, you know, varices, varicella susta is a highly painful uh, condition. And evidence suggests that even the pain outlasts the lesion. And in some patient patients, they suffer for up to three to six months. And therefore, everything you said in that regards are appropriate in terms of getting the patient, uh, you know, screwed. It being cautious to exclude the involvement of the retina by looking at the Hutchison sign, that's very important. But pain control plus adjuvant, some patients may need to have additional uh, uh, dosing of uh, pregabalin or carbamazepine in addition to uh, uh, the analgesia you are providing. And that may continue even when the lesion has subsided. I think that's very, very important. And ophthalmicus is the only exception where we consider topical application of acyclovir. Evidence suggests that it's not useful, you know, in the, uh, the one in the, for damage, you know, the one in the, on the, uh, on the skin. But for optomicus, we, we, there's the only exception to that. The other point I will make is that uh, for CMV retinitis, um, you know, that it needs to be managed at a tertiary level. The only point is that for all our doctors and nurses working uh, outside of a tertiary center, high index of suspicion for patients with declining visual loss, it's important for such patients to be referred, especially if the baseline CD4 count is low. And of course, even in those who are already on treatment, if they are not using treatment properly and the CD4 is dropping, they need, we need to be worried about this. And it's not just only the high, the CMV targets, it targets the, the, the entire intestine, you know, and we, we can't afford to miss that. Again, cholangiopathy is part of the presentation, which we need to be aware of. Um, for molluscum contagiosum, again, for the attending clinician, it's important we recognize that it's a very highly contagious condition. You should be wearing your glove when examining that, okay? Very, very important. The treatment, uh, uh, tretinoin or retinoid, uh, vitamin A derivative, it's uh, not as safe in pregnancy. And therefore, if uh, women and young, you know, you should be a in age group, you need to eat, do pregnancy tests before you, you provide that for patients. And of course, if they are not pregnant, they need to be on effective contraception. So very, very important, we, we recognize that. The other aspect is the uh, example tall. Again, the, Dr. Mula is actually very accurate. Those guidelines are not South African guidelines, and we, there's no way we can follow that. So the only thing is if a patient is on treatment, have eye in the suspicion, and if patients come back to tell you they're having problem, you know, the focusing especially central vision, yeah, uh, which is often painless, is the presentation. That patient needs to be stopped, yeah, and therefore, uh, again, how quickly they, they, it's quite reversible in about, six, you know, 30 to 60 percent of patients, but the moment there is pigmentation change, which you highlighted for the majority, it becomes irreversible. So which means if patient presents and reports that, we need to take it seriously. I think that's the point that everybody should remember. Um, but we can prevent most of these conditions, early diagnosis, and in getting patients on treatment and retaining them on treatment, which means we need to have a system of following our patients who are not showing up for care you know, which is probably one of the areas that we need to strengthen. And also though, for those with low CD4 cans, prophylaxis, you talked about the Battery prophylaxis will prevent that. 
and therefore making sure that we get all our patients who will benefit from prophylaxis uh, uh, to remain on treatment. I think those are just uh, my few comments of mine. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Adene. Um, any last comments from the floor? Is there anybody with any last comments um, online? You're welcome to either put up your hand or to unmute. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm very happy to then close this presentation until we see you again in a month's time. Um, have a happy Friday. Goodbye.